Hey, what's up, YouTube land? Dan here from Geekcast Radio doing another graphic thoughts video. This is where I go through some of the recent graphic novels I've been reading, share my thoughts and opinions on them. I do try to read a pretty large variety of comics, so I'll cover books that kind of show you just the power of the medium of comics, how it can tell stories in many different ways and be effective in doing so. Uh, I will say one of the benefits of today's video is that one comic I'll be discussing was one of my favorite comics I've read in some time, and if by the end of the year it's not my top five, I'd be very surprised. Uh, it was a book that halfway through, I'm like, wow, this is really engaging. I'm really loving where this is going. If it can keep it up, man, that'll be something, and then it did. So if it doesn't make my top five by the end of the year, that means it's been one strong year of comics. Now, I don't feel that strongly about every book I'll talk about, but there is some interesting things I think to discuss with each one. Uh, starting with uh, Danger Doll Squad, Volume 1. And Danger Doll are a series of books that I've actually never read personally. I know there's a huge fandom out there. I've heard many talk about them and seek their praises or speak their praises. So I thought maybe this would be a good jumping on point. Uh, each one of these characters has had their own series. They've never really, in, they've never been a team before. They've interacted. Now this is their time to kind of come together within the world they've been sharing and be on a team even if it's begrudgingly and i will say the book didn't necessarily work for me a great deal uh i will it's not necessarily i think it did anything specifically wrong or was poorly executed there were there, there were just some uh, holdbacks i had um and more of subjective issues than i would say objective first and foremost the art didn't necessarily work for me uh the digital style it's you know it the the background of it existing in this world it, it felt very empty and weightless uh and it it feels like you know existing in this tron s world where there's no backgrounds at times and it makes it feel a little bit empty and it just it just felt like with it going back to like a cgi series from the 1990s and you can see there's craft there there's you know effort put in but the final product just didn't necessarily work um and also the comedy there's a lot of comedy in this and Comedy, obviously, is probably the most objective thing that there is. Um, if, I think for those that do find it funny, uh, it will probably be really, it will work great. I just I just didn't, uh, it wasn't like jokes were bad or poorly timed. It just didn't necessarily, you know, uh, hit me in the right places, as they say. I was impressed by just how it did cross all these different genres. I, I was kind of somewhat worried that it would objectify all these characters, as you can see that they are, you know, uh, they're, not necessarily putting all the clothes on that they need to reminds me of like the 1990s where every w woman character it's like let's put as few clothes on as, as possibly as they possibly can um, and it is uh, as the back does indicate it is mature there's nudity in this but it never i think objectifies its characters it never it's not it's scared to be sexy but at the same time it's not necessarily trying to make it its focal point um, it's part of it it's there but it's not necessarily like hey that's all there is. These are characters, full characters. They all have personalities. They're well-rounded. But, hey, they also, you know, are designed to look a certain way. Uh, and there's a reason for it. And I think that ends up, you know, helping the book. So I think some people might look at this cover and just, like, toss it aside, thinking, oh, this is going to be juvenile. This is meant for teenage boys to ogle at. I think that would be an unfair assessment. But I could see for some that maybe that just the overall aesthetic just in general won't, won't work like it did, didn't for me. But So I can't fully recommend this book, but I think for the target audience it's going for, for those that probably enjoyed the previous series, they'll probably enjoy this. It did prompt me to maybe want to go back and read those books and maybe uh, see if with that background knowledge I will enjoy it more. I will say not, not having that, I never felt lost. I felt it did get a good job of giving an idea of who all the characters were, how this world works, and without feeling like it was throwing a lot of exposition at me. But ultimately, I just wasn't fully engaged by the story. Uh, a book I was fully engaged by, a very different book in every way shape, possible, is uh, Super Late Bloomer uh, by Julia Kay. And this is a graphic uh, diary, really, where it's just going through her life, her recent transition, very simple panel, it's just three panel page in each page. Situations that she's dealing with as she recently transitioned, she's kind of had many of those conversations with people already. Uh, kind of skipping those cliche moments you would often see and just getting into more of the nitty gritty. And I say this a lot because I, like, I love stealing the line from Roger Ebert when, when he talks about movies being empathy machines. And I think the same thing is for comics, but I think comics even more so because especially when you're getting into a graphic you know, diary like this, 
you're getting the words directly from that person. Like with a film, there's a, there's a lot of people it goes through before it comes to you, right? You have the person who writes it, the person who's acting it, the person who's directing it. So even if it's a, based on a true story, by the time it's actually made, that true story has gone through a lot of filters. Now this is, this a book like this is going from the person who wrote it directly to the person that's consuming it. So the, the ability to, to empathize with their plight is even, I think, increased because you're getting it directly from them. Um, sometimes that can be more, you know, not saying that movies can't get you to empathize because that's obviously a different skill. Part of it also is being able to see it and in, in reenact it in real life or through through film and, and through acting, unless you're just getting kind of the words and the, the visuals on screen. So I, as someone who's never kind of obviously gone through that situation and you know, know people that have, have had conversations with people have had, but could never truly understand what it's like. And I'm not saying that like reading this now I know, I know everything I could possibly know. This is just one person's story. It's a part of it. I think in, 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 in a while it's certainly helpful um, just to get that one perspective um, and kind of see kind of a, a life a thing, a way people, problems people have to deal with that I've never in my life had to face. And I think it's important in that, in that realm. So would definitely recommend it. It's, it's also really executed well. It's funny. It's, you know, the art's not necessarily trying to you know, it is what it is. It's certainly like, hey, it's very, you know, Sunday comic-esque in that manner. Um, but it's just well-paced. It, even though every, it's not this connecting story, it's not like this picks up here and then ends in, in this page. It obviously is a part of a whole. And I don't know if this was a digital comic first or like where this began, if it was all collected. I could see that, but it still flows really nicely. So it's also, I think, what's a benefit about the book is that you could read it from you know cover to cover. You could read it you know just picking up and picking up a page, and it works as a whole. It works as a piece um, in, in that realm. So that's like a benefit of doing it this way as well. All right, uh, another book that I did like. I didn't love everything about this book, but there were some things that did truly amaze me. And it's a beautiful disaster. This just comes out from Titan Comics. This was actually a European book that was translated. Uh, re and uh, what I love about European books often is that they do have this. Um, bigger uh, bigger size and especially for this book because it, it takes it's a dystopian uh, future because why not um, and but having it larger size like this it you just kind of brings home the scope of the story it, it takes place in the city landscape you see these people trying to survive these gigantic bugs from outer space have come and you know we follow these survivors just trying to find food um, but it, it what the, the weird thing is that the thing that kind of I started thinking about reading this by the end of it was the movie Sunshine by Danny Boyle um, because that's a movie that starts as the science fiction adventure um, it's about people going to the sun it takes place in the future and the sun's dying so they're traveling trying to uh, reignite the sun and then by like the last third it makes a sudden shift to be a psychological horror film and it, that kind of happens here in a way where you're just like okay well they're surviving they're trying to kill these bugs they're just trying to find food and then slowly but surely, it's not as drastic as Sunshine. Things start creeping up, and you find out these are just these aren't just bugs. They're sentient. Uh, we learn more about them. It gets into the idea of identity. It gets into things like being part of a whole, trying to kind of forge your own path, um, and you know it, it gets into much deeper things than you maybe your more more typical uh, dystopian future type of film or movie. Um, I don't know if it all worked. I felt like it's a book that thought it was smarter than it actually was. And that could be just something lost in transition. I do love what it was really effective was just how it used its camera, uh, where, where it placed the camera to kind of show this world, show the scope. It was really inventive. Uh, the detail on uh, the, the actual kind of locations and stuff like that was really impressive. It looked great. Uh, the characters were pretty solid as well. Uh, there was one piece though that I think I think the reason why it, it, I'm holding back my love for this is one sp specific moment I still don't fully understand. Uh, we're following these three characters throughout this world, and without giving it away, you know they're running into trying to find survivors, and something happens, and a character like, holds back really key information for a reason I truly don't understand. <laughs> Um, and it's partially when the, it gets a little bit weirder and you know you find out that maybe these you know the, these aren't dumb bugs I will say they're not uh, you know it's like it's not super trooper-esque where suddenly we're having that it turning into like a satire but 
these bugs have more going on than just like eating people. So uh, I definitely would recommend it. The character's design, I think the one thing that didn't work for me was that it felt very static. So there was more, when the, the more emotional beats happened, it wasn't as effective. But outside of that, it was, you know, it was really well, it was well done when it came to just the, the art itself. And then you have the, you know, I opened that and then there's an image of that showing maybe why it was wrong uh, when it comes to being able to express emotion. But I'm glad I read this. I would definitely recommend picking it up. I just don't know, like, if when it tries to be more than this dystopian story, I don't know if it, it, it kind of loses itself a little bit. But outside of that, it was interesting to read. Um, and then last, but of course not least, as I indicated, I have All the Answers, because that's the name of this book, All the Answers, by uh, Michael Kupperman. And I've never read a book by him. He's a, he's a former uh, Eisner winner, winning uh, writer, so uh, as the Eisner's just happened recently. Uh, and I could see this being up for an Eisner myself um, coming up next year. But this is a, a graphic memoir as well. It's him telling the story of his father. Um, and his father was his child prodigy in who became a huge star right, kind of as, in right before World War II was happening during the like right when radio was becoming big before TV really was an established property um, and then kind of he, he was part of the show called WizKids um, it was this like trivia show where smart kids would go on and kind of uh, answer questions and it became this huge sensation uh, but he's having we start starts off with is that his relationship with his father is not great there's a huge distance there um, partially it's because of the way his father is where his, his father is just kind of just distant from reality itself even his own memory and then it gets into that because he learns his father has dementia uh, and he begins to act up and now there's so much about his father he doesn't know his father often doesn't talk about his past he doesn't really talk much at all and it just opens up the opportunity, kind of the necess necessity of learning about that story and finding out, okay, well, who is my dad? Um, you know, where did he come from? Like, what was that life actually like? So it's partially him interviewing his father, going through records and kind of finding out about like, where, the, you know, where was he? But at the same time, it's just, you have this, this tragedy of just a father and son relationship with him, them trying to understand one another, the challenges of that happening, how, memory works like how you will often purge things that are hurtful you know his, his father you know was basically used uh, you know he his family his mother and father you know saw the opportunity of using this kid and becoming a star but not just by his parents but like by people in general uh, one thing i learned was that uh, henry ford was a huge anti-semitic uh, the you know the, the, the person who brought us the assembly line and uh, it was a very much spreading during that time for before World War II, and partially his father thought he was kind of manufactured to because he was Jewish to kind of be an answer to that and to show that uh, you know being this hope hopeful person um, and kind of showing that being a bright spot for the those that are Jewish. Um, and, and it was so that was kind of interesting how how pop culture was used to try to you know permeate and make people break down some of those barriers that were really huge at the time. And I think it was just interesting, like learning about Henry Ford, knowing, <laughs> knowing that, uh, you know, that, that occurred. It's such a thing that's for whatever reason, not really covered, but also just like, this is really kind of the birthplace of American pop culture in a way, you know, we're seeing television being created, movie stars being created. Um, and he, he connected to many of them, like many of the stars of the time from Milton Berle, Berle to, you know, uh, Abbott and Costello. And it's this guy who's kind of met like some of the biggest stars of all time, but he doesn't really talk about it. It all begins with a, like a, one of the opening sequences is him watching an Abbott and Costello movie and seeing like, he gave me a puppy. And it was just one of the few times he actually mentioned his past. So there's just a lot going on. And I think what really works for me too, is just that it's so, it's told in a way that's just straightforward. Like this happened, and it doesn't try to sugarcoat things, or it doesn't try to spice things up unnecessarily. It's just telling the story in a very matter of fact way. Uh, but that matter of fact way is just really well done. It's well paced. Uh, it, it was. It has. It, it's a combination of when you have a really fascinating story with a with a effective framing device, and it's executed really well. Uh, you know, it's like when you get. It's similar to like a documentary, for example, right? Where there are documentaries that end up being really good because it's just the right person in at the right time. Uh, there's documentaries that are really good simply because the story itself is all you need. And there's documentaries that are really good because it 
it's they're well edited they're well directed they take a story and they are able to take a good story and make it better and i think that's the case for all the answers it, it this is a good story by itself but the the ability to kind of u utilize it to focus on a father and son relationship just the tragedy of something like dementia like you know myself i've had family members have dealt with it and it, it is so sad just seeing someone become a shell of themselves and just seeing when you're trying to get answers from someone and like partially it's them unable to partially them not wanting to um in the sense of like his father is reluctant to talk about his past so i, I don't want to give too much away and it felt like i kind of did but it, it's not necessarily like it's a, a lot of spoilers here it's just well told it's it was i was kind of blown away by it and like i said it's not something where it's like oh my god this is the art is fantastic or it's the story that you've never seen before it's just bit by bit I was engaged and I just like it went I read this super quick like I just couldn't pick it up I ended up like reading this I started at like 10 o'clock at night and I'm like oh I'll, I'll be done within 15 20 minutes and and I ended up reading it all and ended up kind of picking it up and looking through it again so it's it's yeah, the, the the pull crit coat by a Jack Taper it's poignant funny and sad and that's pretty much it like and when you can be all <laughs> those three things all effectively um, and, and it ends up working really well. So I will say, you know, if all the books I talked about, the one I would recommend the highest would be All the Answers. Uh, again, I feel like I might be hyping it up too much and you're gonna go and people are like, yeah, it's fine. I don't see what's great about it. But for me, uh, it just, I think it's partially because I love those type of stories. I can, that, that time frame of just early American pop culture history, even I love the Woody Allen film, which actually gets mentioned in this, uh, uh, Radio Days. Um, like that, I find really that, that time frame fascinating. Um, so just learning more about it, this huge piece of American pop culture. I mean, if you watch something like the movie Quiz Show, that actually gets talked about within this too. Um, and how his dad was a piece of this. Uh, it's interesting, like when you're, you have someone who's, who your father was just like enormous child prodigy, huge star and how that affects you. You know, we think of child stars of something of today, but really that's been going on since radio and television has existed, so. All right, well, I've rambled enough on today's video. If you want to check out more from me, check out Comic Concierge. Hopefully, we'll have new episodes out soon. Go to Geekcast Radio. Uh, but for now, remember, comics are for everyone. The key is finding the right one. Until next time, thanks for watching.